we should be live on Twitch. Just take a look. Cool. Looks like it. And what's crazy is I don't know how to share the live link. Mostly do these to record. Uh, well, chat settings. Get going here in a minute. Like twitch.tv slash. Uh, yeah. Okay, cool. All right, let me just pop this in Discord. Wherever I put it. Okay, cool. All right. Well, I'm going to start trying to stream more kind of the live process of what I'm working on. I go through about creating things, solving things, get an inside look at kind of the full spectrum of developing on uh, just the Internet of Things like hardware, software. We'll have uh, web app stuff going, firmware that we're writing, uh, a little bit of hardware that we're making, the... Um, the ESP32 dev board that we were working on. So it's just kind of all things, Internet of Things, um, Fuller Stack, as uh, the Particle CEO coined a couple of years back. But uh, anyway, what are we working on? So we are working on, I've been working on this for months and wanted to try and start sharing more of the process. And it's called Deploy the Fleet, kind of a spin on the... Star Wars, if you're, if you're a fan of the original Star Wars, uh, I guess that would be 4, 5, and 6. seems like Vader says, like, deploy the fleet all the time. It's, it's really not that many times, but uh, that was one that uh, my brother and I always used to, to, you know, joke around with. Whenever something happens with the Empire, you deploy the fleet uh, to solve it. So, uh, and the, it's a play on words because it, this is for, um, like it says, the easiest way to manage firmware update, updates for embedded devices. This is a way to update, uh, sometimes they call it OTA, over the air updates, and allows you to manage them. And I guess I could give just like a quick demo here before we go into the actual work part of this. So, uh, let's log in. Okay, cool. Um, and let me uh, stretch this out so it looks a little nicer. It is responsive, as you'll see here, but I was in kind of just a weird in-between size there. Okay. Uh, so this is basically what it looks like when you log in. You have this uh, drop down of products that you create. Right now, I only have one in this account. Um, as I'm writing documentation, that's what I'm working on. But kind of gives you an overview of how many devices in this product. I'm calling this the ESP8266 Arduino Core. <clears throat> like I said, it's for documentation writing. And it tells you what the default firmware version is, how many active firmwares there are. You can look at that here from the firmware tab. You'll see that I have one active firmware that has one device. It's version 3.0.0. It'll show inactive firmwares. These are older versions. Uh, again, this is all part of writing documentation for this. And then you, there's a devices tab that'll show you what devices have checked in, when they last checked in, and what their reported version is. And, uh, you know, there's a feedback tab for submitting feedback. So this is what I've been working on for the last several months and hoping to launch... Uh, this week, I hope, but we'll we'll see how it goes. It's just trying to get all the, the fine details nailed down. And every time I feel like I'm ready to launch, there's something that's just not quite right. And I need to get over that. I need to just launch it and get people using it so I can get some feedback. But uh, this is the idea. You upload firmwares for the products that you create. 
And then when your devices, uh, whatever firmware logic you write on your devices, you know, it could just be a, a dev board or an actual product like the puck holder or the pucks that we worked on before, or that ESP32 dev board, um, it will check this service. And if you come to the main dashboard here, you get this custom update URL so that when you hit this URL, it will do its magic and return a firmware update if you need one or nothing. It'll return like a 304, not changed if you're on the current version. And so um, I've built in support for the ESP8266 Arduino core library, as well as the ESP32 Arduino core library. And then of course it'll work with just the normal ESP IDF uh, 8266, as well as ESP32. So that's in a nutshell, what it is, it's an update service that's hosted. Um, if you come to, uh, let's see if I can find it. Read the docs. Yeah, here we go. This will get us close enough. Uh, you've got OTA updates. And I think if we just come up to the top here, you know, it'll say OTA over the air update is the process of uploading firmware to an ESP module using a Wi-Fi connection rather than a serial port. Such functionality becomes extremely useful in cases of limited or no physical access to the module. And so what you'll normally do is when you're doing IoT, if you're just getting started, you've got, uh, you know, this is a Adafruit uh, Huzzah 8266. You might have, oh, where is it? Grab it. You might have just like the old classic Arduino Uno that you're doing. You generally are uploading, uploading firmware via the serial port. So you connect it to USB to your computer. You up to, uh, upload firmware that way, uh, which works great. And that's uh, fine for development. It's very rapid iteration. But then as soon as you need to, even for projects, and this is focused for both maker projects, but also um, actual products. In my case, for those that may be new, we made the Smart Puck. It's a little embedded e-paper display. Uh, the lighting's awful. It's a little embedded e-paper display inside of a hockey puck. Huge Washington Capitals fan. Uh, for things like that, that we've actually sold to, some, uh, to customers, uh, they can't plug it in and open the Arduino IDE and update their firmware. So they need uh, something a little bit more polished, a little bit, um, you know, hands off that they can use. And so that's where it becomes really helpful. But even on like a home Arduino project, like if I were to take this huzzah, feather huzzah and hook it up to some sensors and say, I want to like record the temperature in my garden or in my garage or something like that. It, if I need to make an update to that, I got to go grab it unplug it or do whatever, bring it back down to my laptop or take my laptop up there and update it. It starts like that breaks down really quick, even on maker projects where you need, uh, you want to update the firmware. It can be a real hassle to do that. There are ways to do that uh, through the Arduino IDE. They're very clunky. You can see in the ASP, the ASP, the ESP8266 Arduino core documentation here, you've got um, OTA updates over Arduino IDE, web browser and HTTP server. And essentially what we've done is taken this HTTP server approach where you're storing the firmware somewhere, it doesn't matter where, and the ESP8266 hits some endpoint and makes a decision. They give you an example here of, of how you call it and how you could even do a, a PHP server because PHP is still a thing. Um, no offense to the PHP programmers out there, really like whatever works and gets it done for you. I'm all for it. Uh, but anyway, that's what the example is in. And so I took kind of this idea cause I've felt this pain with many projects of how to update. And I started, uh, working on some contract work for other people that needed similar things of, I need a way to update it, but I can't have my customers plugging it in and going through the terminal or via the Arduino ID and all things like that. And so deploy the fleet was my solution to that problem, which allows us to essentially uh, deploy projects and products and have a little bit of firmware logic for them to hit the endpoint. Again, this custom endpoint that's created for you when you create a product and um, get the updates that way. And so that is the project that we've been working on. It's been a ton of work doing. So this is a full uh, responsive web app. 
I use the Quasar development framework to, to build this piece of it. This is the, the front end piece. And then that talks to uh, a back end service that I've written that's also deployed uh, in, the, in the cloud where all great things are deployed, uh, which handles all of the logic of um, the interaction of the front end app here, as well as the uh, endpoints here for OTA updates and things like that. And so, um, there's the front end, there's the back end. We're working on documentation for it so it can be easy for people to use. I just wrote um, this morning, actually very early, a uh, Arduino library that I'm hoping will be live in the store. So there's some things like, there's a whole bunch of process that goes around making something like this that I wanted to share um, with people that might be interested or interested in internet of things or web development or firmware development or all of the above. Um, I love all of it. And so just kind of showing the how the sausage is made, as it were. So anyway, that's that's the general idea of what we're building here. And what we're working on tonight is documentation, which is like the least sexy part of all of this. But uh, so I have this. Uh, oh, this is another piece of it. This website um, that I built. This is using, did I leave it in down here at the bottom? There you go. Powered by Jekyll and Minimal Mistakes. It's a, Minimal Mistakes is a theme, a Jekyll theme. Uh, but anyway, just a simple web page that has, you know, a landing page for people to get um, familiar with how this works. It's got, you know, this getting started uh, documentation. Oh, the toggle menu because we're, we're certain this is as responsive as well. So if I go out now, there it goes. Check that out. That's pretty cool. So what does this look like in this view? Sweet, okay, cool. So things like that all handled by this framework, this uh, theme that I'm using for Jekyll. And uh, just some, you know, like I said, this, this one, I wasn't looking to go over the top on the website and I, I've used Squarespace in the past, but honestly, um, I don't, it's not very expensive, but it's just, it's a little bit too expensive for what I needed to do. I just, I needed this to be very specific. And so homepage, documentation, a way to launch the app. The app is launched, it is hosted separately. And so um, that gets kind of weird with Squarespace where you have like this idea of like launching an app where you're still leaving Squarespace. And so I tried to keep sort of like a dark theme um consistency between them so like this has kind of got like a dark theme to it when we launch the app you can see that it's got a dark theme however i've enabled this switch to light mode and so depending on whatever you you like or you think looks better um you can you can change that up so feature it's a feature of the app uh i think the dark looks cool though so anyway uh documentation so i started what i'm working on here is i've got this getting started and this menu is going to drive me a little bit nuts like this, but uh, that kind of goes through getting started and what things look like and do. But then I've got these quick start guides that I'm working on. And so the ESP8266 Arduino core uh, is what I'm working on. And it's not here because um, this is the, the, the actual live website and I haven't uploaded anything yet. So it's just, it's, um, placeholder stuff at the moment. Um, so, but what we're doing, I can talk about this a little bit. So I've got this Jekyll project. If you have not used Docker before, I highly recommend you learn it. It is, it is extremely, it's becoming extremely important in the industry and is a skill that you will not regret having. It is just Docker has exploded over the last, um, four or five years. Uh, specifically and so it's it's everywhere and knowledge in it is very helpful to have but a, a practical use of that not just being on like the technology bandwagon and the the shiny red ball syndrome why are we using docker in this scenario well let me tell you so jekyll is a ruby framework so it's a static uh, website generator that takes uh, markdown files i really personally like writing in markdown like just raw content i don't like these things like confluence and even squarespace like these editors these you know they call them WYSIWYG, which see is what you get editors where you're all of them have their own quirks and their different ways of 
their different philosophies or approaches and you have to get used to even Squarespace, you know, for as easy as it is once you get the hang of it, like you have to learn some of the quirks of how to drag things and create layouts and stuff. And um, I just, like I said, personally, I like the very simple approach of just writing Markdown and Markdown is really come a long way as well with a lot of features as well that are supported, especially with Jekyll. They have a lot of helpers and things for inserting images and um, buttons and all sorts of things. And so you don't get, at least for me, again, this is a personal preference. I don't get hung up so much on all of the amazing different things I can do. I have a very limited set of tools in the toolbox and I can use them. And, and most of it, again, is just writing raw content in Markdown. So I like that approach. And then Jekyll, again, based on Ruby, takes all of that, um, builds it into static files, and then you can deploy them. I mean, even to something as simple as just like an S3 bucket on Amazon to host it. And so um, full circle, why, where does Docker come into all of that? I am really big lately in the last few years of my uh, developer, programmer, engineering career as whatever you want to call it in not having my local machine be so hyper configured to have everything that it needs and, and when you are dealing with a lot of these technologies across front end back end and specifically when you start throwing hardware into the mix uh, for writing firmware your tool chains start to kind of overlap and hardware is normally a little bit behind as far as like if you're using like just general compilers gcc and things like that your your hardware might require an older version and your regular just development stuff if you're writing c++ code might require a new one and then you're managing tool chains and it all gets really messy and what docker allows you to do is set up all of those dependencies inside of an image you create an image with all the dependencies and then you run code within what's called a container and what that does for us here is I do not have Ruby, as far as I'm aware, installed on my laptop. Um, I don't even know what the Ruby, like how to launch the Ruby command line. Launch Ruby shell. Um, yeah, like I, I don't need, I just want to make sure I'm not uh, telling you lies here. interactive IRB I think it's just IRB you just type IRB or, or I guess Ruby you just do Ruby okay so just to prove I'm not lying to you here I, as far as I'm aware it's not so it might be okay Ruby not found IRB okay anyway I do not have Ruby installed as far as I'm aware on this machine however I can build my um my website for deploy the fleet without having it installed. I just use a Docker container. And the way I do this for development at least is I run this, uh, not that command, uh, Docker run, this Docker command here. So I'm gonna say Docker run, this dash dash RM says remove the image, uh, sorry, remove the container after it's done. I mount a volume in, which is the current working directory and inside of the container, it'll be mounted at slash uh, SRV slash Jekyll. The IT means interactive and terminal, meaning I can type things and get output here in the shell. And then I'm mapping this port, port 4000 from inside the container out to my local machine so I can hit local host 4000. And then I'm gonna launch the Jekyll image, which is Jekyll slash Jekyll. And inside of that container, I wanna launch the bash command. So when I hit enter here, it's gonna give me a bash prompt. And right now I'm inside a Docker container where if I want to type Ruby, you can see, I'm not sure what's supposed to happen. I don't, I don't really know Ruby. It's not my thing. Um, but that, it didn't give me a command not found. So I'm going to get rid of that. I think IRB, is that the command? Okay, yeah, IRB. So now I'm in a Ruby shell. I can do things like one plus one, I think, equals two. Kind of like the Node.js um, interactive prompt. And I'm not really sure how to quit. I'm just gonna control C, exit maybe. Okay, cool, exit. 
and clear. All right, so I'm at this bash prompt. I'm inside of my container. Again, all of the dependencies are managed by Docker. I don't have to know anything about how to install Ruby, how to configure Ruby for Jekyll. I just use the Jekyll image, which has everything pre-configured. So all I have to do now that I have my directory mounted in here is just say Jekyll serve. And I'm not server, serve. And while that's starting up, I'm just gonna check, make sure that we're okay on the Twitch stream. Everything looks like it's loading pretty well. Okay. So what Jekyll serve is gonna do is it's going to install all of the dependencies based on my uh, config YAML here. It's gonna, like it says, it'll install any Ruby gems that we need to run the site. This will take just a, a second to do. And once it, once it does all that, it, again, because I passed that dash P 4000, 4000, it's gonna punch that out outside of the Docker container and allow me to have access to it from my local machine so that I can dev just right here in Visual Studio Code, nothing special, and I'll be able to hit uh, localhost 4000. It should finish up here in just a second, perfect. So you can see it's serving up on 0.0.0.0, 0 .0 .0 .0 .0, 4000. So if I come over here now, and instead of hitting the live site, I just change this to localhost 4000. I'm going to get the exact same site, but now if I go to getting started and I go to the ESP Arduino core where it was just, just placeholder, you'll see I have all sorts of stuff that I'm in progress of uh, writing. And so that's really, to me, that's super cool. I don't have to worry about, again, I don't have to worry about maintaining the version of Ruby, updating it. Um, figuring out Jekyll dependencies or things that happen in between versions. Like it's locked in this Docker container for me to build. And from here I can build the the site and then I can deploy it. Um, I'm using render as my uh, deployment. I, I used to be a big uh, Heroku fan, but I've kind of, I, I just found render. It's a uh, render.com. I just found them, oh, about a month ago and super impressed. Uh, really like some of the things they, a couple of people have said, it's what Heroku could have been, but never became. And I mean, I'm not gonna say that that's my final verdict. I'm still feeling out render, but so far I've been really happy with it as far as hosting um, the the website, the static site. And you can do static sites for, for free on render. Um, I also host the, uh, the app on render as well. And so, so that's pretty cool. So we're using Docker, it's running, and this was auto refresh. So like if I, um, this is the DTF website, where is my, let me close this, I'll save. Okay, here we go, Arduino core quick start, here we go. So if I change this to your sample project test and I save it, you'll see I get this uh, regenerating one files down here. And then if I come back over here and just hit refresh, you'll see sample project test. And so that is pretty cool. And so I can dev, like I say, just in Visual Studio Code, it's my development environment of choice. And uh, nothing special, just running a Docker container behind the scenes, uh, keeping uh, that's, that's serving up the local website so I can hit it on localhost. So that is what's going on. Um, and yeah, so what are we doing as far as documentation? I said we're working on documentation. We are. I want this to be easy for people to pick up and use quickly. The idea is once I launch, officially launch, um, I'm going to start marketing this, 
in you know ESP forums that I can find. Just see, you know, hey, use it for your project. It's free uh, to get started, and I will. I haven't even created like the pricing tiers yet. I have an idea in my head of what that will look like, but um, for now, it's just gonna be free for everybody because I'm not expecting any official, you know, products to use it. And so uh, I'm just trying to get it out to as many people as I can to just try it on projects, you know, just make, take, take whatever maker project you've done and see if you can integrate, deploy the fleet with it and give me some feedback on how it was and how it works. But I imagine a lot of people, and I've actually in doing some IOT contract work, I found people that are using the Arduino core libraries as part of their product, which um, surprised me a little bit. That's not something like for, for the puck stuff. Um, I, I've used just the ESP IDF. Um, and I like, what do I have against the Arduino core? Nothing particularly, I, I would say. Um, but I, I just feel like there's too much black box there for me again, um, that I don't like just installing a bunch of libraries. To me, that's not, uh, it doesn't give me the warm fuzzies when you're just pulling in random Arduino libraries. That's very much more of a maker approach, but I know some people are building actual products um, and that's a whole different story of, you know, the state of the internet of things and products and stuff. But um, I know a lot of people use the Arduino core libraries, both on the 8266 as well as the SP32. And so I wanted to start there as a way to get people started really quickly. Um, and I had this long, long process, which now is not very long. I mean, it's, it's still a little bit of scrolling, but before I was going through a whole bunch of stuff to set up, but then I, I finally uh, created a Arduino library. So let's do uh, github.com slash this ESP8266 Arduino core deploy the fleet library. And uh, I'm hoping I've submitted this to the Arduino store, so uh, the Arduino library manager repo. So I'm hoping in the next few days it'll be picked up and we'll be able to um, add it right within the Arduino ID, IDE, which would be really cool. Right now you can add it as a zip file, which is really cool, but uh, it, it'd be extra smooth if people could just add it right from within the IDE, like getting started with deploy the fleet and the Arduino core library should take like less than 10 minutes and that's kind of what i'm going for so um yeah let's uh i guess just go through i'm gonna leave the stream up again nobody's really here or watching or anything but um i'm not gonna talk the entire time i felt like that was a good intro of like all of the different things that we're doing and there's a lot of cool stuff happening you know like like i said the docker here and front end, back end, there's just a lot of stuff going on. And I feel like there's stuff as I'm going through this and working to share that people might find interesting. But some of it is super boring, like I will be reading through and making grammar adjustments and um, changing, you know, the steps for for how you would get this stuff set up. So I need to make sure at one point I had had my actual like Wi Fi SSID and password in here. So just catching stuff like that. Hopefully I've cleaned all those up and I'm not broadcasting it on Twitch. Um, oh, is the, yeah, I am seeing the video buffering. Is video buffering? Use the low latency toggle under the advanced menu and settings to disable low latency mode. Um, okay. Settings, advanced, because that's going to, okay, low latency, that's going to keep bothering me. Okay, cool. Close. All right.
think I will just read this out loud as I'm going through to see how this works. Okay, so for continuing, follow the ESP8266 Arduino core instructions for installing the library if you haven't already done so. And so just to make sure that link works. Chords Manager, this is the actual Arduino code, Arduino core install. Um, okay, cool. And then, so we should probably actually say before any of this, uh, here's a markdown tip for you. Um, you'll notice I have one, one, every step is one. That is in markdown that will get translated. You can see over here when it builds to one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, it, it automatically figures the numbers out for you. So if I were to have numbered these correctly, it also works if I do like one, two, three, but then if you add a step, like for example, I have nine steps here. And now I'm going to add a new step one. If I was trying to keep that updated in my markdown here, I would have to come through and edit every single step to have a new number. And that's time consuming. We don't have time for that. So let's do one. Launch the Arduino IDE. Okay. Save. Okay, see now I've got 10 It all. It re renumbered them all automatically and now my step one has launched the Arduino IDE. So let's do that. Arduino IDE. And it says, you know what, I'm gonna, Open a new sketch. Okay. Okay, launch the Arduino. From the tools board ESP8266 boards menu, select the appropriate board for your hardware. So I'm saying to go to tools board, and I have already selected the, and then I'm saying to go to ESP8266 boards, which uh, you can't see the menu. The Arduino IDE has a, struggles a little bit with menu displays. It's actually on a separate monitor right now. Uh, but I've already selected the um, Feather Huzzah 8266, which is the correct board. And it says create a new sketch with the following contents. So let me make sure that this is all updated and working. Why is it all indented like that? I wonder if that's like, I wonder what happens if I, uh, if I take this stuff all the way back and then save it. I wonder if it still does that. Generating. Oh, it doesn't even pick it up that way. Okay. It must just be padding as part of the the way that Jekyll, the minimal mistake steam shows code. Okay, well, it's fine. It doesn't look too bad. Just loses me a little bit of space on the left and it's probably gonna paste funny. Okay, so I'm gonna copy that. Uh, and it says, create a new sketch with the following contents. Okay, here we go. So I'm gonna just paste it in there and yeah, see it puts it in like that. That's kind of a, that's a little annoying. I don't know how to fix that though. Just do that. But it kind of sucks that you have to do that. Save. Um, November 9th, a, yeah, whatever. That's fine, we can just save it as that. 
Um, all right, let's just take one more second to see if we can we can fix this. What if we just go back a little bit like that? Save that. Oh, that do it? There's still just one space. Um, well, it's better. All right, well, I'm going to leave it like that. That's at least a little better. If I go one more. Like that. Oh, it just kind of changed colors. How far in do I have to do it to make it? Yeah, okay. All right. Well, I'll leave it there. Because it, it's, it's a little better that way. Okay. Uh, step four. Replace your Wi-Fi SSID with your actual Wi-Fi network SSID name. Replace your Wi-Fi password with your actual Wi-Fi password. Okay, so I'm going to pull this off screen and I'm going to actually let me pull it back on for a second. So this is all at the top, your Wi-Fi SSID, your Wi-Fi password. And so let me just pull this over here. Enter that. And you know what? For now, I'm just going to leave them. Let's do this. I'm going to leave them blank for now so that I can kind of show you guys. Uh, compile the project by clicking the verify button or using the Control R keyboard shortcut. So I'm going to hit Control R. Yeah, let's make this a little better. Oh, and it does not compile. So that's great. And I see exactly why we need a semicolon there. Who is my... Slash. I just uploaded an example this morning. Do I have the same problem here? No, I do not. I've got a semicolon there. Okay. So I need to, and this is why, this is why you walk through it, right? Like find stuff like this. I thought about doing these as gists, but they, there's no, as far as I'm aware, I haven't tried, there's no dark mode for gists. So I kind of like the way it looks like this. So let's just come in here and fix it. Put a semicolon in there. Okay, and then come back to here. Now with the semicolon, we hit Control R. Let's see if there's any other mistakes. Sweet. That works. Okay, so we've got 25% of program memory, program storage space, and 33% of dynamic memory is, is being used. There's not a lot to this, so um, well, I'll come back to that. Uh, connect your hardware, upload the firmware by clicking the upload button or using the Control U keyboard shortcut. And we should see something like that, which is actually wrong. We'll create a new version of that here in a second. Um, okay, so that works. And at this point, um, I'll just walk you through what it's doing. Uh, we come in here, this is all using the Arduino core library. The serial begins, this is all pretty standard stuff, output that we're doing a ESP8266 example. For, this is a, um, 
just a loop that prints out this setup weight four, three, two, one. That gives you a chance. You know, sometimes you've got this chicken and egg, like you can't launch the serial monitor when it's not connected. And if you have stuff happening right in the setup loop, uh, the, sorry, the, not that setup, the setup function, you might miss it. And so this is kind of a way of like to give you a few seconds uh, to open up the serial monitor and, and not miss some of the stuff that happens there. Uh, Wi-Fi mode, Wi-Fi STA, which is just, I'm going to try to connect to your Wi-Fi network using your um, SSID and password. And then in the main loop, it's just going to wait until we get connected. And once it's connected, we're just going to print out this is version, whatever the version is up here. Wait five seconds and do it again. So every five seconds, just print out the version. Super, super simple uh, sketch. And so let me pull this over here. I'm going to put in my SSID and password. Save it. And uh, build it. And then I'm going to connect the hardware, but I'm going to hold it in reset so that it doesn't, it's actually running some of this uh, firmware already. And it says upload the firmware by clicking, yep, okay. So we'll do that. So I have it in reset. I believe I can launch the serial monitor now. Yep. And I'll drag that over so you guys can see that. Like that. Um, I do say open serial monitor and set the baud rate to 115200, which I have done. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to come back over to the ID. I'm going to do control U to upload. And I know you can't see this because I want you to have my Wi-Fi password. So it's uploading now. It takes a little bit on the ESP8266. Shrink this window a little bit more if I can. That's the minimum size right there. It's almost done writing. 100%. Set up, wait, three, two, one. Okay, so it didn't catch the version there. So I'm gonna watch what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna wait till the next version comes through. Clear it. No, oh, come on. Clear it and then reset it. Oh, it gives me all that garbage. I wonder if I just unplug it and plug it back in if that'll work. If I do clear output and then Ah, I'm just missing that. Well, I mean, this is what I'm actually seeing. So instead of having to deploy the fleet, like, yeah, so, all right. Let's take a screenshot of this. Because uh, this is essentially what you should see. That's the whole point of this. Okay, launch GIMP. Control Shift V. And what we'll do is we'll do file, export as. I'll just overwrite the one that I currently have in there. Um, images, docs. V1, okay, I'm gonna export, replace. Okay, so now that I did that, uh, and the reason I'm changing this, by the way, if you haven't noticed, uh, it says this is version 1.0, and I'm, right now there's no features in Deploy the Fleet for semantic versioning, but I have a whole bunch of ideas and a backlog of 
cool things to do using semantic versioning as far as like determining whether we should send an update or not based on semantic versioning rules. And so I encourage people, you don't have to, but I encourage people to use semantic versioning so that um, those features that I intend to implement uh, will work. And so, and I also personally think semantic versioning is a good uh, standard. I've worked at many, uh, well, I've worked at many places. I've worked at several large companies and one in particular, which shall remain nameless, um, I swear, like the the managers and the the powers that be came together and came up with new ways to call new versions of the software. Like every couple of years, like we we had a time where we called them. Oh, what did we call them? Oh, now I can't remember. I can't. We had a name for them, but then they they wanted to be like Microsoft, and Microsoft sends out service packs, so we started naming them service packs. But then that was super confusing because what we were doing was not like a Microsoft service pack and it was actually confusing people in IT. This was a, um, oh, what's the word I'm looking for? This wasn't like end user software. This is installed at, at large uh, companies. Uh, the IT departments were getting confused of like, oh, we don't really need to run the service packs because, you know, in Microsoft land, those are big updates that are scary. And in our case, they were really just like patches. And so they they went from calling them service packs to patches, and then they called them something else. I can't remember. I've shut it all out because it was traumatizing. But I like semantic versioning because I think it's a nice standard way. Um, there's libraries, like I said, that that handle the versioning and some logic around the version numbers. And so um, I'm a fan of it personally. So okay. And uh, but now that we've done that, we should be able to refresh this page, and we have our new image here. Okay you should see output similar to the following, which we do. Uh, the sample project is a very simple firmware that repeatedly outputs the current version over serial. You are now ready to modify your project to use Deploy the Fleet as the update service. Cool. Um, great. Integrate with Deploy the Fleet. In this section, you will modify your existing firmware, which will allow you to manage updates via Deploy the Fleet going forward. First up, install the DTF8266 update library. To make the integration as easy as possible, we created an Arduino library. It can be installed from the built-in Arduino library manager or by importing a zip file. So it's I have not received notification that the library repo has accepted my library, but I guess we could look for it. Let's, let's look for it. Uh, tools, okay, uh, let's do this. Let's create a new sketch so you can, you can, everyone can see what I'm doing over here. So if you go to tools, not tools, uh, sketch, <clears throat> include library, manage libraries, it pops up the library manager and if we do a search for, let's just say DTF, I yeah, would assume we would not find anything. So eventually you would just search for DTF, this underscore ESP8266 update, and you'll see uh, the library that I wrote, which is really cool, by the way. That's not a hard thing to do. You, you write the library based on the Arduino library spec, and then you just do a pull request, not a pull request, you do an issue, you open an issue on the library repo and just ask them to include it <clears throat> in their their library manager. And uh, it takes them a few days because there's, I mean, I'm sure hundreds of them. When I went, there were several on the first page of issues that were waiting to be merged. Um, and then somebody will add the URL to your repo and it all magically, you'll launch the Arduino IDE the next day and your library will be there. So it's really not that hard and really cool that they have the ecosystem for that. It's great, great for makers. Okay, so, but since I can't do that, I'm gonna skip this section for now, even though it is the recommended way. And <clears throat> let's do the import zip file. So first of all, let's slide this aside and this aside, we'll come back to that. Um, download the, let's do steps for this. 
Some of the latest. Released a zip file from. So one of the things I love about Markdown is just the this this is so efficient when you just know some of the simple things. And I don't know everything there is to know about Markdown, not even close. But like just creating a link in Squarespace is like you got to paste it and then you got to highlight exactly what you want to be the link. And you better not be off by a character because it will literally make only part of it a link, an HTTP link. And then you've got to select, um, you know, whatever edit link or insert link and then paste it in versus just I can just type it and be done with it in two seconds in markdown. That's just for me again, one of the advantages of, of using markdown. Um, so download the the latest released zip file. So if they come to this page, they're going to see version 1.0.1 and the zip file right there. And I will make a video <clears throat> about this so that um, People can have a walk through. <coughs> Need to bring some water to these Twitch streams. Download the latest release zip file from there. Okay, so let's do that. I'm going to click on it and it will download. Okay. And I already know that I'm going to have to clean up. might want to name it differently. Ugh, I'm going to have to think about that. Wait, wait. Okay, uh, I'll worry about that in a minute. So I've downloaded it. And then we'll say in the Arduino E. Essentially what we're going to do here is we're going to say sketch include library add dot zip library. So I'm going to say from we'll assume that you're already in the ID at this point from the sketch menu select include uh, we gotta outsize it include library and what's the wording on it add dot zip library and zip is all capitals that's it, library. Okay, sketch, include library, Ugh. add dot zip library. Okay. I'll just say, shoot. Navigate to the location where you save the zip file in step one. Collect it and click OK. So if we do sketch, all right, so I'm going to try that over on my other one here. I'm going to do sketch, include library, add zip library. I'm going to go to where I just downloaded that V. Select OK. 
Okay. <clears throat> so it did add it. Great. I need to name them differently. And the reason I need to do that, let me just pull my files over here, is that um, in your home directory, you have the Arduino folder that the IDE creates for you. And then you have this, uh, here are the projects that I've, you know, this is the sketch that we're working on right now, but then it has this libraries folder and it just adds it as the name of the zip file, v1.0.1. And this has, you know, <clears throat> the code that I wrote for the library. So that's kind of a dumb name for the folder, kind of a quirk. And what's interesting about that is that the, um, if you come to file examples, like it will, I don't think it'll show in this window because it's open, but the examples from custom libraries, it'll have the correct custom library name. And so to me, that's kind of a quirk of the IDE. The IDE should look at like in here, there's this library dot properties, uh, which if we open up, you'll see like it has a name. If it were me, I think, as the IDE, the IDE should look at this name and then save it as this. So I will make sure in the future, I name my zip files that for the release. So I'll post a new version of the release before we launch, because if they add it now, it'll be, it'll make, it'll add it as that folder. And if they add it later, after I change it, it'll add it as a different one that could create some weirdness. So, um, so anyway, but that works. That's how you add the library. Uh, and that's it. That's all I had to do. And it is added. Arduino does have simplicity down pretty well. Um, updates from Okay, so I did that. And I'll add instructions in a screenshot for the library manager later when we have that. Let's just come back over here and see how that looks. Ugh. Cancel. Download the latest release zip file from this place. From the sketch menu, select include library, add zip library, navigate to the location where you save the zip file in step one, select it and click okay. Great. As a trivial example, we'll have the firmware check for an update as soon as it is connected to the network. Depending on your firmware and use case, you could trigger the firmware update process with the press of a button or some other event that contextually makes sense. This is kind of weird if you watch this and you have some feedback. What I'm essentially trying to say there in not a lot of words is there's lots of different things that you might want to do to trigger an update. You don't want it just checking. Getting an update is not the core purpose of your hardware. You have other things that it's supposed to be doing. And so you don't want to just randomly check for updates. There's going to be some convenient time or convenient way to trigger that update. In the event of the puck, there are no buttons. So I can't say go and push this button to trigger an update. And so uh, the way I handle that actually um, on the original version was through the particle um, ecosystem, which is where if somebody plugs in a USB cable to this, so it's charging, so it's not on battery power, after it does an update, it says, oh, uh, I'm plugged into power. Now's a good time. I just finished updating the display, so I don't have anything else important to do. Now's a good time for me to check to see if there's a firmware update. And so that's a contextually good time for this product. However, if you have some other product, uh, it might just be like a button or it might be something as part of a phone app, like a UI where you could uh, go in and trigger an update. And so that, that's essentially what I'm trying to say. Like there's, for the example, it's very trivial, but you would want to put this code where it contextually makes sense for your project slash product. And so let's see, make sure the library header is included at the top of your sketch file. And so, um, that is going to be, this. I wonder if this, since this is all the way to the left, I wonder if this has a little space. Let's just check that really quick. Does it have the one character? It doesn't. That ah, just must be some way of Jekyll, the way Jekyll does it. Indented. Oh, well. 
Uh, okay, so we want to include that header. If you are using the sample project we just created, simply change your loop. I don't like that I use simply there. Change your loop function to, I'm going to say contain. No, no. Just, yeah, we just created, let's say replace your loop function. with the following code. And that code is this. It's pretty simple, actually. So the only thing different here is I got this. Oh, I don't like that I have that. So let's get rid of that. Just extra lines we don't need. I just had the static variable, check for updates, set it to false. And then if I haven't checked for updates, check for updates the first time it connects to Wi-Fi. And then I set check for updates true so it doesn't ever do it again. So just uh, this is essentially a way to, hey, when I first boot up and I connect to the network, check for updates uh, before I do anything else. And then I, I would say like below this, which is how I've done it here, is where I'd put my other code. This is indented too far. Here we go. That all looks good. And so the magic here, if you're following along at home, is literally just one line of code. And that's why I really like the idea of creating the Arduino library is because now this is it. Like, And this, this check for update stuff is all just code peripherally that I created to make it work you know, on a single time on boot. But if this was inside of like a button handler or something, um, it's just this line of code. This is all you need to get Deploy the Fleet working with the Arduino core stuff, along with the header. And obviously it needs some information. It needs the update URL, and we're just gonna pass in the current version. And that's what also helps it know, hey, am I on the current version? Like, what is the current version? Deploy the Fleet knows what the current version is. Am I on it? Yes or no? Um, and so it's important to send the version so it has some, otherwise, if you just if you didn't send a version, it would just say, oh, hey, here's the version you should have. It's version 1.0.0. And if you're already on version 1.0.0, the ESP 8266 is going to do a complete uh, firmware update. And that's not a huge deal, but that's flash writes and stuff. You know, there is wear and tear on the on the flash memory. And so to, to optimize, we don't if if we report version 1.0.0 and that is the current default version and deploy the fleet we don't want it to respond with here's version 1.0.0 again because the Arduino core code itself is not smart enough to know, oh, hey, that's the same version that I'm already running. Don't do it. It's just going to say, oh, you sent me a new firmware update? Great. I'm going to load it. And so that's a waste. It's a waste of everybody's time and resources. So uh, passing the version helps us uh, make smart decisions on the deploy the fleet side. This is an optional parameter. Um, in the Arduino core OTA library, which is what the DTF ESP to ESP 8266 update library wraps. So that's it, single line of code, which is really what I'm going for here. And um, you point it to your DTF update URL and off you go. So I'm going to, let's save that and then let's refresh. Cool. And then if you are integrating an existing project, all you, um, I'm gonna say if instead, although it feels a little weird, if instead you are integrating, deploy the fleet with an existing project, all you need to do is add the following line of code wherever you would like the update process to occur. Remember you will need to define DTF 
update URL. Well, no, I'm gonna actually. Okay, let's grab it. It's it's this line right here. And what we'll say is, we'll just make it a string. Your DTF update URL. Current version, i.e. 1.0.0. 1. 0. 0. Let's see how that looks. Yeah, okay. Okay, and then I already have the note here. Make sure you replace the URL and firmware version placeholders in the above code with your own values. The update URL can be found on the main dashboard for your product. And let's just make sure this link works. It does, dashboard. And on the dashboard, I show where that is located. Okay, so that's the code. So now following the instructions, I'm going to add this header to the top of my file over here off screen that you can't see. And I'm going to replace my loop function with this and then make sure that it compiles. I'll save. And then I'm going to control R to compile it. Oh. Oh, see. Um. Okay, yeah, see, this is where, I, these are simple problems to solve, but man, I found if people get hung up on the documentation, they, they give up pretty quickly. So uh, I just got an error saying DTF update URL is not declared. So I'm, I'm this is meant to be a pound define. Um, so the question is, do I add an extra step or instruction in here? I'm just going to do this. Um, let's say this. You also need to define the variable DTF update URL and assign it the value of your Update URL. And then we'll just say pound define DTF update URL. Okay, this is CPP. Uh, another shout out for writing in Markdown. Uh, try maintaining code blobs in Squarespace or some other fancy site builder. Um, I hate it. And so, again, markdown for the win. Very simple. Okay. You also need to define the variable DTF update URL and assign it the value of your product's update URL. So just like that. Okay. So I'm going to copy that. It's an extra step. I mean, you could just hand write it in here, but um, nope, I don't like it. 
I don't like it. That makes it, that's too hard. I'm going to take that out. Uh, replace your loop function with the following code. Make sure you replace DTF update URL with the URL found on your deploy the fleet dashboard. And then we'll change this to be DTF update URL like this. Like it clearly is not going to compile like that. Um, and just making sure like what that looks like. And let's try to build that again. <clears throat> See what that looks like. Make sure you replace DTF update URL with URL found on your deploy the fleet dashboard. DTF update URL was not declared in this scope, which yeah, it, it really is angry. But I think the error message is actually a little bit more friendly if I don't have the brackets. Let's take a look at that. Yes, it is much more friendly. Okay, so we're gonna just do this. And again, I will make a polished video showing this. So that will help other people that maybe get stuck on that as well. Cool. So I've done that. And I'm going to let's let's use it. Watch this. Let's I'll give you a quick demo. I got to wrap up the stream here shortly, but let's create a new product. Create new product. And we'll call it um, Twitch. Create. Okay, you can see it gives me this update URL. I can click on this handy copy button. And I will come over to my thing that's off screen here. Replace that. Hit save, and then now let's try and build it. And sweet, we have successfully built it. Okay. So back over here. If instead you are integrating Deploy the Fleet with an existing project, yep, that's good. Export firmware from Arduino IDE. Before you can upload your firmware to Deploy the Fleet, you need to export it from the Arduino IDE. Compile the project using uh, by clicking the verify button or using the controller keyboard shortcut. This technically isn't necessary, but just in case Arduino changes its approach, I include the compile because currently the export functionality automatically compiles. But if that ever gets removed, I don't want to have people exporting and then not realizing they had to compile first. So I, I we double compile and that's intentional um, just in case, like I said, if Arduino changes their mind on how they want that to work. Export the firmware binary using the sketch. So I've already compiled mine over here. And it says uh, export the firmware binary using the menu sketch. Sketch, export, compiled binary. Or using the control alt s keyboard shortcut. Your firmware binary will be exported to the same folder where your sketch is located. Okay, and that is, uh, let's show you that. Arduino, sketch. I'm in the Arduino sketch November 9th, and you can see I've got this, and I cannot figure out why it puts Adafruit on there. 
I think it's because I'm using the Adafruit Huzzah board, but I I hate that it does that. I don't know. Dot Ino dot Adafruit dot bin. It's just such a weird name. I wish they gave you an option to name it something else, but whatever. That's that's where we're at. Okay, upload firmware to deploy the fleet. Um, let's, let's drag this over here and do that. Okay, so I've got Twitch here and it says open to deploy the fleet. Check. Create a product if you don't already have one. I have created one. Navigate to the firmware page. Firmware. Click upload a new firmware. Done. Select the firmware binary. Now you can either click here and it'll open up a, a thing to, to look at the files like that, or I'm just gonna drag it and drop it. Sketch I know .bin. Uh, set the version to the same value used in the firmware code, which if you remember was 1.0.0. .0 .0. It's it's probably still like happily printing out on the serial thing because I haven't unplugged it yet. So I'm going to do 1.0.0. .0 .0. And um, optionally add any release notes. This is version 1.0.0 .0 .0 for the Twitch stream. and click upload, upload. Okay. Active firmware, no devices. Since this is the first firmware for your product, it will automatically be marked as the default, which it is. Your first update. Now that everything in your firmware is configured, let's create an update. And just to illustrate, uh, get all this in, we're wrapping up here. This is still, like if I clear the output, this thing is still every five seconds, just boom, this is version 1.0.0. .0. So we're gonna put that aside for just a second. That firmware is still running. Imagine that this device is off somewhere in not next to my laptop land. Okay, modify the firmware version to be 2.0.0. .0. Oh, see in the check. Yeah, see, this is where we've changed things. Um, so let's... Uh, right here okay yeah modify the current version variable to be 2.0.12 zero dot zero Modify the firmware version. Wait, what? Oh, it wasn't done building. Modify the current version variable to be 2.0.0. .0. Update the serial output message in the loop to be this is version 2.0.0. .0. Okay, so I'm gonna say, oh, see, I don't have to do that because I'm using, um, so we can get rid of this step altogether. This is why we do this. Compile the project by clicking the verify button or using the control R keyboard shortcut. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to build it. Export the firmware binary just like we did before. So uh, we are going to sketch export compiled binary. Okay, while it's doing that, next step is open deploy the fleet. Navigate to the firmware page, click to upload a new firmware. Select the newly created firmware binary. I am going to slide it over again like I did before. It's actually named the same and that does not matter. Deploy the fleet will give it its own special identifier and everything and takes care of that for you on the back end. Um, set the version to 2.0.0. .0. Select mark as product default. You'll notice this is new. Mark as product default was not here before because we didn't have any firmware, so obviously with the first one that you upload, we're just going to mark as default by default. Like there's there's no option to not make it the default. It just we assume it's the default because it's the first one. And so I'm going to select that, and I'm going to say this is version 2.0.0 .0 for Twitch. And I'm going to, you know what I haven't tested? This is a good time to test this. Sorry, let's do uh, 
new tab emoji i've not tried using emojis in the notes and if that will save properly let's see if we can blow this up this is version two for twitch thumbs up emoji upload it took it and it shows it so that's cool um click upload reset your device okay so now what's going to happen and let's walk through this is going to be the we're, this, we're going to wrap up with this for tonight because um, i think uh, our instructions are done let's just read the last part your device should update and start out putting the new message indicating it is running version 2.0.0 so let us grab our serial output here right there okay so this is still running version 1.0.0 deploy the fleet has said now we're going to run 2.0.0 and it is the default and so what i'm going to do is now reset the device it's going to reach out using that um url endpoint that we sent it and it should if i haven't missed anything um i think i got everything right here it should grab 2.0 and you'll see that in the output here but i want to show a couple of other things while we're doing that and so do we have any devices yet let's refresh none okay that's normal so devices we don't have any yet so now what we're going to do is i'm going to refresh yeah because the first time we didn't have the update code yeah yeah that's all right so i'm going to hit reset it's going to say setup waiting three two one this is version oh what if i oh i didn't okay this is great i never uploaded we missed a step up here We never programmed this. Okay. That's great. That's great that we caught this. Okay. So I never said in the instructions to load it. So I'm still running the original non deploy the fleet version of the firmware here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say upload. This is going to go a little bit out of order, but I'm going to upload from the Arduino IDE, it's going to compile the sketch, it's going to upload version two. Um, let's get this back here. This will take just a minute. Okay, we're at 57% uploaded 63%. 73. The 8266 is a little slower to program than the SP32. Okay, setup. There you go. That's right. Three, two, one. And now what it's doing, you notice it's not saying this is version. It's going and looking for an update. And actually, if I refresh devices, uh, nothing yet. Oh, did I put the wrong? It's Twitch. Oh, it has to sync the NTP time. Yep, so that takes a minute. Okay, just wait for it. Boom, device ID comes online. Last check-in, 918. That's my current time here. And it'll say right here, reported version 1.0.0, pending update to 2.0.0. Why would it have said, oh, because I didn't change the current version to 2.0.0. <laughs> I uploaded the same... Uh, my version one and version two are the same. Okay, and that's because it's getting late and I'm being a dummy. However, as you can see, I got a boot a reset here and it's saying deploy the fleet and it says 1.0 pending update to 2.0. It's never going to get that update to 2.0 because I screwed up the update. I didn't change the update version. Um, so this is just going to keep you see the the last check in change. So let's let's fix that. OK, I'm going to wait for it to reset again and, and do the wait four, three, two, one. And I'll I'll show you how this is supposed to look. Stand by. Let's wait for it to. You don't want to see it's like right in the middle of resetting. We don't want to interrupt that. It's writing flash. It's programming. 
Okay, set up weight three. Okay, we're gonna unplug. Okay, goodness. All right, now I'm gonna actually change. We're gonna create a, a version 3.0. Version 2.0 is broken because I didn't properly change it. And I'm going to verify it. Uh, let me just show you this while it's not compiling. If we move this over, no, nope, not like that. Uh, this window. Come on. It'll show it in a table like this, and it'll say it reported version 1.0.0 when it checked in, but the default firmware version is 2.0, so it sent 2.0. And so that's what this kind of indicates. And if you hover over it, it'll say 2.0.0 to update sent to a device awaiting confirmation if succeeded. The service can send the firmware update, but then it's on the device to make sure that it actually gets updated. There could be a power outage or a brownout or something during that, and it might not take. And so it'll check back in at some other point. But this gives you an idea as a manager of devices, hey, did this uh, succeed or not? Let's uh, export my compiled binary, my version 3. Export compiled binary. And we'll see how this is actually supposed to work. Okay, 921, is that what time it is? Okay, 921, great. Firmware, upload a new firmware. Now that we have this working. 3.0.0, mark as product default. This is version 3.0.0 for real this time. Upload. Okay. And uh, so this is another kind of feature this I kind of accidentally got into this. You see I have active firmware. Active firmware is any firmware that is marked as default, has a device associated with it, which 1.0.0 does, or has been sent to a device. So even though that there are no devices on version 2.0.0, Remember, we tried to send it 2.0.0, which, because I'm a dummy, has version 1.0.0 in the actual firmware, so that's why that didn't work. Um, but that will all change here in a minute. So 3.0 is the correct firmware version now. We're gonna bring this back up. Uh, I believe it'll just reconnect. So I'm gonna plug in my device, and I think it should come right back. Yep, right there. Okay, now, it is doing a couple things behind the scenes because there's no real time clock on this board. It's going out to an NTP server, grabbing the correct current time because that's important. All of this is done over HTTPS that requires X509 certificates, which require the current date and time to validate that the certificate is still valid, validate that it's valid. Okay, so back over here on devices, I'm going to hit refresh and it's still probably, here we go. Reported versions 1.0, it's trying to update to 3.0. We'll come back over here. And you'll see after we go through that reset process, um, it'll be on version 3.0. So there we go, it just rebooted. Uh, this reset caused two, I believe, if you look up in the documentation, is a, a flash reboot. And now we're going to go through deploy the fleet example 4321. Now it's going to pause here again because it's going to go back out and say, hey, do I need an update from deploy the fleet? And this time it's going to say I'm, I'm running version 3.0, as you'll see in the output here in a second. Do I need an update? Deploy the fleet's going to say, and no, you don't need an update because 3.0 is the default and you're on the default. And you can see here, this is version 3.0. And now if we refresh our table here, it's going to say reported versions 3.0. There is no pending update. And now if we come back to firmware, you'll see our active firmware is just 3.0. It's the default. It has one device. And these other versions, 2.0 and 1.0, are inactive because they are not pending updates to any of the devices and they're not being used. And I'm really excited that this thumbs up worked. That's really cool. Okay, so last, last thing to show here is, oh, oops crap, 3.0.0 is not what I want to be running. That was a mistake. There's a there's a small bug. So let's go back to 1.0. Remember 2.0 is we borked. That's my fault. So I'm going to come in here. I'm going to click on 1.0.0. And down here it says set as default. 
So I'm going to click set as default. And I get this message saying, OTA update logic change. You are about to set this firmware as the default for the Twitch product. This will go into effect immediately. And this firmware will begin to be delivered to devices that request the default. Are you sure this is what you want to do? Yes. Okay. Now again, there's one device associated with three, so it's active, but 1.0.0 is also active because it's marked as the default. And so what will happen now is if we hit reset on our device and it goes through this again, it's going to say, hey, I'm running 3.0. What should I do? Deploy the fleet. And deploy the fleet is going to say, oh, the new default is 1.0.0. And in the future, I have plans for making this, adding lots of logic for you to be able to set uh, deployment rings and um, update logic of like, don't allow updates from three back to one and all things like that. Right now, it'll just do whatever you tell it to do uh, to get started. And so uh, let's see if the device is updated yet. Okay, reported version was 3.0, but we sent it 1.0.0. We'll come back over here and uh, give it a second. Again, it, it takes, the, the 8266 takes a while to flash. And so there we go, it flashed. It's now rebooting. And we'll see, deploy the fleet example, wait, 4321. It's gonna go and connect out again. Remember, this is just at boot. It's looking for an update. It's gonna say, what should I do? Deploy the fleet's gonna say, oh, you're on the current default version. And uh, it'll, it should start saying this is version one again, just like that. So that's the idea uh, of the service. I love seeing it work. It's just really cool to see that. This, this could be anywhere attached to the internet and that would work. And so I think that's really cool. So that's going to do it for the stream today. Uh, that was a good long hour and a half there we spent together uh, working on the project. So going forward, the idea here is I will show you just exactly what I'm working on. You might see some front end code, the app code um, in Quasar. Uh, you might see some of the website stuff. Like I say, I'm trying to get the documentation finished so we can launch this thing. You might see firmware development. Arduino library development, posting Arduino libraries to the library manager. We're, just, we're doing everything here. Everything IoT around getting this Deploy the Fleet service launched really quick because it makes me happy. I'm going to refresh the devices just to see it change back to 1.0.0. It's really cool. So that is going to do it for the stream today. Thanks so much for watching. If you watch this afterwards, nobody joined. I don't expect anybody to join. Nobody knows who I am or what I'm doing. So hoping to get the word out. So thanks. And I hope everybody has an awesome uh, morning, afternoon, evening, wherever it is, whatever time it is, wherever you are watching. I hope it's an awesome day for you.